Uh, he hello, I'm, I'm Baruch Vishoff from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I'm honored to be here as part of the Visionary uh, Sackler Colloquium Series, and I'm just uh, pleased to have so many people here. Before I start, let me thank the Academy staff for the incredible work that they have done with a meeting that has an, so many different moving parts and has done it all with uh, such good cheer. So we need science for many things, the most profound of which is supporting our sense of wonder about the world around us. Everyone here will have had moments in which science has solved or created a mystery for them. For me, one of those moments was as an undergraduate in Geology 101 at Wayne State University, when Professor Mazzola explained the origins of the Harrisburg surface, which gives central Pennsylvania the distinctive, its distinctive lattice pattern of, of rivers and gaps. At that moment, I realized that all the landforms around us, even the flats of Detroit, were created somehow, and it was up to us to decode them. Another such moment of wonder was reading uh, Joanna Berger's The Parrot Who Owned Me, and realizing and getting some insight into how our white-crested cockatoo appeared to have such human emotions despite our species having diver diverged so long ago. Uh, here are two of those emotions. There's another. Uh, uh, both of which I'm sure will be familiar to all of us. A, th a third moment was following the suggestion of our son Ilya, an evolutionary biologist, that we take out our lawn and let our backyard go feral. <laughs> Speaking of feral. Uh, with native Pennsylvania flora, after which he gave us the first lessons in how to observe the seasons. Here's a late fall view. Now. Now I can wonder why the first grackles arrived 10 days early this year, even though the main flock still took over our yard on March 7th as usual. Was it a sign of climate change or my own improved powers of observation? Science provides a sense of wonder, not just from revealing the world to us, but also from showing us that the world can be revealed. For that reason, I tell my advisees in our decision science major that they should join a research lab, really any research lab, just to see how science gets done. They may discover that they love the life, including the camaraderie with the graduate students and postdocs who are the engines of much of our science, or they might find the constant fussing over details to be mind-numbingly dull, to use the phrase that the Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes uh, applied to archaeology. <laughs> Uh, and then choose to get their science from Nova, Frontline, the New York Times, and other translators. Either way, they will have seen the care, conscientiousness, and pursuit of uncertainty that distinguish science from other ways of knowing. Along with that scientific turn of mind, always trying to get to the bottom of things, knowing that one never will. Although we can choose not to do science, we cannot choose to ignore it. The products of science permeate our lives. The second session this morning has distinguished efforts from four technologies that it would have been impossible, even inconceivable, without scientific advances. The very existence of those technologies should be a source of wonder, even among those of whom they sometimes evoke a sense of terror. If we are to render a fair judgment of technology, we need to understand what it can and cannot do, how, its effects can, how well its effects can be predicted, and how they might change over time. That knowledge gives us the best chance of envisioning a world with and without a technology and how to take best advantage of its potential while minimizing its risks. Under understanding a technology, though, is very different from understanding the phenomena studied by a single science. Although each technology may be led by advances in one science, uh, be it nuclear physics or molecular biology, its implementation requires contributions from many sciences. For example, for, example, for example, every technology has a human element. Someone must design, manufacture, inspect, deploy, monitor, maintain, and finance it, and, and prevent its misuse. As a result, predicting a technology's risks and benefits requires social science knowledge, just as it may, be, may require seismology, computer science, or meteorology. In order to make such an understanding possible, someone needs to identify the few scientific facts that we as de decision makers absolutely need to know about the technology from among the myriad scientific facts that it would be nice to know. 
then someone needs to convey those facts to us in a comprehensible, credible form. Accomplishing those tasks requires experts and, and communicators to listen to us. First, to see what we know already, and then to see how well their communications have closed the gaps in our, critical gaps in our knowledge. If experts communicate early enough, they might even be able to improve their technology so that it meets more of our desires, wants, while raising fewer of our fears. Creating such links between the public and the experts is the communication challenge addressed by this Sackler Colloquium. Uh, this slide shows a vision of that communication process from the Presidential, Com Presidential Congressional Commission on Risk, with its iterative cycles of defining problems and their context, analyzing risks and options, making and acting on decisions, and then evaluating their consequences, all interwoven with continuing st stakeholder communication. There are many similar accounts. Some of the best come from the National Academies and may be seen on a desk uh, table outside. My favorite graphic, though, comes from the Canadian, this Canadian Standards Association report. Um, its center of the, the center of the process that they recommend has a fairly standard project management scheme, starting with project initiation and ending with its implementation and monitoring. A nice touch is having reality checks between the stages with the options of going back until one gets it right or giving up or ending if one doesn't. On the left, it's the, scheme sh the, the, the scheme shows the need for risk communication at all stages, connected by two-way arrows, such that the experts must continuously listen to the public and hear its, speak to the public and hear its needs. Here, as else, here I, I should know, here as elsewhere, risk communication is a, as a term of art for communicating about both risks and, uh, and benefits that follow from our choices. Later, we'll hear about the science of such consultation. One of its findings is that our experts are often seen very differently than they see, than they see themselves. In their classic, The Social Psychology of Organization, Daniel Katz and Robert Kahn use the phrase pseudo-democratic to describe the worst form of management, pretending to care, but, uh, but appearing not to listen. We will hear what is known about how to avoid such situations and how to establish the trusted relations that any communication requires. Yet, as we may, we may hear in tomorrow's panel with, the presidents, pre with presidential science advisors, even devoted public servants playing vital roles may not learn what they need to know what what may not learn what they need to know about science in time to ensure that it deserve it secures its deserved place in our public discourse rather than having to fight for a hearing after people's minds have already been made up later speakers will describe what has been learned about when scientific issues arise when they generate light and when just heat and when they get miss getting the attention that they deserve once we have the public's attention, we need to use it well or risk losing or misdirecting it. This figure shows one reflection of such failure. In, 2000, in the fall of 2005, as Asian flu loomed, my friend Larry Bill Brilliant convened a meeting of public health experts who could assess the threat and technology experts who could assess the options for keeping si our society going if worse came to, came to worse. In preparation for the meeting, we surveyed their beliefs. Here are their answers to the first question in our survey, asking participants to judge the probability of the virus becoming an efficient human-to-human uh, -human transmitter in the next three years. The public health experts, the black bars, generally saw a probability around 10%, with a minority seeing a much higher probability. The technology experts, who are as smart a lay audience as one could ever imagine, all saw higher probabilities in the gray bars. Now, it could be that the technology experts had heard both groups of public health experts and had sided with the more worried ones. More likely though, they had seen the, experts, the public health experts' great concern and had assumed a much higher probability. However, given the anticipated case fatality rate of 15%, as indicated in responses to another, another question, a 10% chance of efficient transmission provides more than ample reason for very large concern. 
Knowing that numeric probability is essential to orderly decision making, however, it was nowhere to be found in the voluminous coverage of H5N1. Knowing that probability is also essential to evaluating public health, public health officials' perform, performance fairly. If they seemed to be thinking 70% and there was no pandemic, they may have seemed alarmist especially if they seem to, be, seem to have been thinking 70% during our H1N1 mobilization. So you will hear more about procedures for eliciting such, judge, such judgments and when they can be trusted as capturing the beliefs of experts or lay people. Without valid explicit expressions of people's beliefs, we cannot know what they are thinking, nor what to say to them, nor how well we are communicating with them. We are without that research, we are in effect flying blind regarding our communications. The presenta presentations that follow will have many surprising results regarding what people know and don't know about the science relevant to different decisions and what they learn easily and only with difficulty. These surprises about people's behavior are not surprising to behavioral scientists. Much of our stock and trade comes from documenting the ways in which people fail to read one another's minds or, in, or to introspect accurately on our own. Here are just a few. For example, the common knowledge effect arises when we exaggerate how much of what we know is shared by others. Although that is a charitable assumption that they know much of what we do, it is also one that creates gaps in, in our communications when we, have, when we fail to say things that are, that are seemingly but not actually obvious. The false consensus effect arises when we exaggerate how widely our attitudes are shared. It can leave us surprised when other people look at the same facts but make different decisions because they have different objectives. The myth of panic in the face of disasters is commonly assumed but rarely observed outside of disaster movies. The myth of adolescent, adolescent unique sense of vulnerability persists even though adults are at least as, as likely to exaggerate uh, their control over situations and many teens express an exaggerated sense of premature death. The discipline of scientifically sound communication is straightforward. Step one, identify the science that most relevant to the choices that people face. Step two, find out what they know already Step three, design communications to fill the critical gaps, evaluate, repeat as necessary. Executing this scheme requires view, viewing communication as a strategic activity rather than as an afterthought. It requires something like the consultation processes recommended by those Canadian and American reports, ensuring that the public has heard and been heard in a trustworthy, respectful way. It also requires people with the right skills. We need subject matter experts to get the facts right. We need risk, anal risk and decision analysts to identify the right facts. We need social science researchers to see what people know and learn, and designers to make the content accessible to them. Yet even when the stakes are high, it is rare to see a strategic communication process with the requisite staff and empirical evaluation. Why is that? As mentioned, our intuitions can lead us to overestimate how well we understand others, hence how little we need evidence about their beliefs and values when we go to communicate. By one account of the science, which I attribute to the late Herbert Simon, behavior follows simple principles. Here are some simple principles of, of judgment each supported and elaborated by, by basic, uh, basic research. Taking the first, there's good reason to believe that uh, keeping track of how frequently we, frequently we observe members of a class of events is an automatic process, one that happens without our making any uh, deliberate effort to, to do it. However, it is also a process that can lead us astray when some things are disproportionately seen or unseen, leading us to systematically misestimate their, uh, their, their probability. Here are some simple principles of choice. This is how you make decisions on the world that, that you have assessed given your judgments. Uh, taking the first again, there's good reason to believe that people 
typically consider the return on their investment in thinking about their decisions. So, for example, they won't stay, stay tuned to our communications if, we don't, if they don't seem trustworthy, relevant, and comprehensible. Thus, behavior follows simple principles. However, the set of principles is large. The contextual triggers evoking the principles that will be operative in a particular situation are subtle. The interactions among these behavioral principles are, are complex. As a result, in order to make use of our basic science of human behavior, we need to collect evidence regarding each application. Otherwise, we are grasping at the straw of somebody who offers us a simplistic solution of the form that all we need to do is X and the public will understand us. The final panel of this colloquium offers some bold proposals for, for getting ourselves organized for applying the science of communicating science in a strategic way. One effort that is already in motion is the Food and Drug Administration's strategic plan for risk communication, which includes a risk communication advisory committee that I had the honor of chairing for several years, and which, which prepared this guide to reducing the barriers to applying science to, uh, to communicating science. Each chapter considers a different kind of communication challenge, whether it's conveying numbers, giving people an understanding of the processes by which risks are created and controlled, communication between doctors and patients, conveying warnings and, discla and, and disclaimers. And each chapter ends with a section on how to evaluate one's efforts for no budget at all, for a small budget, and for a budget commensurate with the stakes riding on effective communication. For stakes, stakes for the sender and stakes for the recipient of those communications. In her eulogy for my Uncle Joe, a distinguished child psychologist, his granddaughter Rachel and my cousin David's daughter said that when she asked him why people did things, his wise answer was, there's always more than one reason. For just that reason, we need to apply the full range of social behavior and decision sciences presented at this colloquium, coupled with the best available subject matter expertise in order to meet the communication challenges that we all face. If we succeed, then the public will get the greatest value from our science and the technologies that it can produce, along with a sense of wonder that exists in its own right. Thank you.